Well, hello and welcome to our Mission Church online service. Uh, We are just super excited that you have tuned in and joined us today on whatever platform and also whatever time you may be watching this when it, while it's on demand. Um, but we are just starting a brand new series this week called Minor Prophets. And we believe it's going to be a blessing. It's going to be rich. And we are just grateful that you get to be a part of this with us. So please enjoy. Hello everyone, I'm Pastor Kyle. I want to welcome you to our online service. We're so glad that you've taken time to join us and we pray that it's going to be a blessing to you. We're excited this week to start a brand new series called The Minor Prophets. Now I know when you first hear that there's probably not a giant wave of excitement that washes over you. But um, let me encourage you, these are small books and yet they have powerful messages and things to teach us. In the Old Testament, you have the major prophets. Uh, Those are the larger books. And then you have the minor prophets, which are the smaller books. So major minor does not refer to uh, the, the kind of message they shared as much as just how long or how big a book they wrote. And so we're going to be stepping into a series looking at some of these smaller books, some of the books that maybe we've just breezed over in the past, maybe we haven't read before, uh, maybe don't get a lot of time and attention, but have very powerful and relevant messages for us today. In fact, we're going to start this series by jumping into the book of Habakkuk. It's a very short book. It's only three chapters long, and yet it's got a powerful message. You see, Habakkuk dealt with a question that I think you and I all deal with. A question that at some point every single human being on the face of the planet will ask themselves, and that question is this, where is God when life hurts? You see, all of us have difficulties in life. It's just part of the human condition, right? We encounter things that are difficult and challenging. Some of you watching right now, may be experiencing something very difficult. Maybe you've just had a long season of darkness these last couple of years with depression, anxiety, with COVID, with all of the factors that we've been wrestling with. Maybe you're wrestling with the loss of someone that you love. Maybe you're going through a financial hardship. Maybe a relationship that you care deeply about is is on the rocks and, and you're struggling with that. Maybe there's a health problem or challenge that you're wrestling with. Maybe there's a friend that you know that's going through something hard. And one of the realities is, is every time we experience something difficult, we tend to ask ourselves, where is God in the midst of the problem? In fact, there's an age-old debate, really, with the problem of evil and suffering in the world that that kind of pits against God this this sort of conundrum that says, well, if God is all-powerful and God is all-loving, then why doesn't he do something about the evil in the world? Why doesn't he stop terrorist attacks? Why doesn't he stop school shootings? Why doesn't he intervene, right? When If God loves us and cares about us, why does he let that happen? And so sometimes... People tend to believe either God's not uh, all-powerful, that that he can't stop bad things from happening, or that he really isn't loving and good and he doesn't care. He's not involved in our lives. But I want to encourage you, nothing is further from the truth. We worship a God who cares about us, who's deeply involved in our lives, and yet is all-powerful and sovereign over the universe. And, And Habakkuk deals with this question, where is God when life hurts. So we're going to step into this book. And one of the interesting things about Habakkuk is 
Many of the prophets, when they wrote books uh, for us to read in the Bible, they, they would kind of meet with God and God would speak to them and reveal something to them and then they would turn and share it with God's people. So the prophets were sort of like a channel to take God's truth and channel it down to God's people. But Habakkuk is a very different book. You see, when you read Habakkuk, it's, it's like eavesdropping, if you will, on a conversation between Habakkuk and God. It's like we get a front row seat to see this little debate or this little disagreement or argument that they had. We get to hear and listen in on this dialogue between God and the prophet Habakkuk. And so this is, this is an interesting take and this book reads a little bit differently because of that. Now, I want you to see in the first four books of this, or the first four verses of this book, the question that Habakkuk is wrestling with. Read it with me. It says, Habakkuk 1.1, 1, 1, O Lord, how long shall I cry for help and you will not hear? Or cry to you violence and you will not save? Why do you make me see iniquity? And why do you idly look at wrong? Destruction and violence are before me. Strife and contention arise. So the law is paralyzed and justice never goes forth. For the wicked surround the righteous. So justice goes forth perverted. Right, here's the big question that Habakkuk is wrestling with and that he's asking God. He, he's asking this question, why is God not doing anything about the violence, the injustice, and the wickedness all around? Habakkuk is living in Judah, right? It was a part of Israel, and, and Habakkuk is looking around, and he sees rising violence. He, he sees wickedness that's unchecked. He sees injustice that is, is, is just rampant through his world and he wonders to himself god where are you in the midst of this why don't you do something about it why don't you stop it in fact he says destruction and violence are before me strife and contention arise like do you ever feel like that in your world like you look around and you just see injustice everywhere you see wickedness and violence on the rise and you feel like god's not doing anything and and, and habakkuk says the law is paralyzed justice never goes forth Right? That's how he's feeling. He's wrestling with this and he's coming to God with his doubts. God, where are you? And why aren't you doing anything about all the wickedness in the world? In fact, Habakkuk prays this prayer. He says, how long, O Lord? How long until you do something? Right? Have you ever prayed that prayer to God? Right? I mean, God, how long are you going to let racism run rampant in our country? God, how long are you going to let this war in Ukraine uh, just rage on while innocent people get killed? God, how long are you going to allow abortion to take millions of lives of babies every single year? God, how long are you going to uh, just let these violence and, and wickedness happen in our world? Maybe you've asked that question before. Maybe you've wrestled with the injustice and the wickedness in our world. Now, look at God's answer to Habakkuk, right? They're having this conversation, and God answers in Habakkuk in chapter 1, verses 5 through 7. He says, Look among the nations and see. Wonder and be astounded, for I'm doing a work in your days that you would not believe if you were told. For behold, I'm raising up the Chaldeans, that bitter and hasty nation, who march through the breadth of the earth to seize dwellings not their own. They're dreaded and fearsome. Their justice and dignity go forth from themselves. Now, here's the wild part. is God pulls back the curtain and allows Habakkuk to see his plan. And God says to Habakkuk, don't worry, I'm raising up this nation, the Chaldeans, which is another name for the Babylonians. I'm raising them up to bring justice, to bring judgment, right? God says... Just trust that my timing and my plan are perfect. God says to Habakkuk, just wait and trust. I have a plan that's working that you don't even see or understand. If you would just trust me, then you would, you would know. But I'm going to tell you that I'm raising up this nation of the Chaldeans who are going to come and judge. Now listen, because Habakkuk is not real excited about that response from God. He's not real excited about it. And in fact, Habakkuk does one of those things, maybe you've tried this before, when you need to say something hard to someone, so you kind of butter them up a little bit. 
Uh, you, you do the compliment sandwich, you know, like you give a compliment in, in between. You, you say something hard that you need someone to hear. Listen to Habakkuk's response in verse 12 and 13 to God. God, are you not from everlasting? O Lord, my God, my Holy One, we shall not die. O Lord, you have ordained them as judgment, and you, O Rock, have established them for reproof. You who are of purer eyes than to see evil and cannot look at wrong, why do you look idly at traitors and remain silent when the wicked swallows up the man more righteous than he? See, here's Habakkuk's problem. Here's the struggle. As he looks at the Babylonians, the Chaldeans, and he says, they're worse than we are. They're they're terrible people. How could you use them? How could you use such wicked, unjust people to bring about your plan of justice? Habakkuk is shocked. God, they're more wicked than we are. So again, they're going back and forth. Listen to God's response. In chapter 2, verse 2, it says... The Lord answered me, write the vision and make it plain on tablets so that he may run who reads it. For still the vision awaits its appointed time. It hastens to the end. It will not lie. If it seems slow, wait for it. It surely will come. It will not delay. See, now God is fast forwarding a little bit in his plan and he's saying, don't worry, I'm going to bring judgment against the Chaldeans too. Babylon is going to pay for the wickedness that they have done, but you just have to trust in my timing. You just have to believe that I have a plan. You just have to believe that I'm working all of this out in a way that even you can't see or understand. And sometimes when we don't see or understand God's plan, we question it, we wrestle with it, we struggle with it. And and through this, God is saying, my plan and, and my timing are perfect. Habakkuk, if you just trust me, I'm at work in ways that you cannot see. I will bring about justice. I will bring right to the earth. So this is the the dialogue that Habakkuk and God are having back and forth, back and forth. And and then finally we come in in chapter 2 to the key message of the book. The key theme, if you will, of the book of Habakkuk. And it's this powerful verse in Habakkuk chapter 2 and verse 4. I want to read this to you. It says, Behold, his soul is puffed up. It is not upright within him, but the righteous shall live by his faith. See, God shares this this verse, sort of drops this bombshell right in the middle of Habakkuk. And, and, And it's this powerful reminder to us that God brings about justice in his own way, in his own time, but that the righteous one is supposed to live by faith. He he kind of shares this contrast, if you will. He says, his soul is puffed up, it's not upright. He's comparing and contrasting two different kinds of people. One person is puffed up, full of themselves. They're self-righteous. Their dependence is on themselves. Whereas the other person, their faith is in God. The righteous shall live by faith. So you have this contrast, right? That that God is drawing uh, between the proud Babylonians and their impending destruction. They're puffed up, self-righteous, depending on themselves, full of themselves, versus what he's calling the people of Israel to trust in him, to humble themselves, and to depend on him, to trust in him. Now, some of you maybe have heard of a man by the name of Martin Luther. Not Martin Luther King Jr., no, this Martin Luther was a monk who lived well before that, and this monk ended up changing the course of the world. You see, Martin Luther was just a regular, average, everyday monk, and and yet he had this internal struggle. He had this internal struggle with guilt and shame, and and every day he would do his prayers, and he would do his penance, and and, and he would get on his knees, and he was even known for, for flogging and beating himself until he would bleed because he was trying to pay for the sins that he had committed. He was trying to uh, find and seek uh, forgiveness and freedom from all the sins and wrong things that he had done. And, And as Martin Luther was reading his Bible, one day he came across a powerful verse in Romans chapter 1. Listen to Romans 1, 16 and 17. It says, this is Paul writing, For I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it's the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes to the Jew first and also to the Greek. 
For in it, that's the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. The righteous one shall live by faith. And Martin Luther encountered, encountered that phrase and he began to wrestle with Romans 1, 17. What does that mean, the righteous shall live by faith? And he noticed this phrase here that says, as it is written. And so he went back into his Bible and he began to search and to try to find what did it mean as it is written. And he finally came across Habakkuk chapter 2 and verse 4. And, and he realized that this is a repeated refrain of Scripture, that this comes up more than one time in the Bible, this idea that, that for those who follow God, that for those who are righteous, for those who really seek after God, that, that their take on life is one of faith. They come to God with a, a faith and a trust, knowing that he's in control and they can believe in him. They can trust him wholeheartedly. And, and so Martin Luther began to wrestle with this truth, and, and he wrestled with the fact that it's, it's not by works that I'm going to be saved, right? And, and so he realized that all the floggings, all the penance, all the prayers that he was doing could never earn him favor with God. In fact, God was calling him to live by faith. Now, Martin Luther famously wrote his 95 theses and nailed them to the door of the church in Wittenberg and, and sparked a, a revolution, right? Now known as the Protestant Reformation, where, where we had this whole turn and wave of theology and doctrine that's like, God is not calling us to relationship with him based on our works. He's calling us to relationship with him based on faith, that the righteous one shall live by faith. This is a powerful nugget that goes all the way back to Habakkuk chapter 2. You probably never knew that it was buried there. And yet it comes up over and over in Scripture. Look at Galatians chapter 3, verse 11. Paul again is writing, and he says, Now it's evident that no one is justified before God. That means they're made righteous or declared righteous before God by the law. For the righteous shall live by faith. There it is again. He's quoting from Habakkuk chapter 2. He, Paul is saying, no one can be made right before God by doing all the right things. No one is going to stand before God and say, God, you should let me into heaven and accept me into your presence because I've been a really good person and I've done a lot of good things. No, he says, the way to have favor with God is the righteous will live by faith. This is the path and the way to have relationship with God. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 38. But my righteous one shall live by faith. So the key issue that we have here in the book of Habakkuk is this issue of, of trust in God. The question is, do we trust in God? When life gets hard, do we trust in God or do we trust in ourselves? Who are we? <clears throat> Who are we trusting in? Do we walk by faith or do we walk by sight, by the things that we can see, touch, and feel? Or are we willing to trust in God even when we can't see, even when we can't understand, even when we don't know? As I prepared for this message, I was trying to think about an illustration of faith and what does faith look like. I remember back to a time when I, I took a group of uh, students uh, to a summer camp and the summer camp was up in Prescott and, and we went up to the camp and we're having a great time that all these different activities that we could do with the students and one of the activities they had there at the camp was this high ropes course and, and if you've ever done a high ropes course it's this thing where there's there's a lot of um, logs and 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 poles and nets and things that you climb all over and it's all very high up in the air and so uh, you know we went to this we went to this ropes course and, and, you know, I told the students, go ahead, have fun. I'll be here cheering you on. Go right ahead. Have a good time. And they said, no, no, no. You have to do it with us. So right then and there, I had to decide that I was going to be the leader, right? I have to step up. I have to set the example. I have to set my fears aside. I'm not afraid of heights, even though I'm kind of afraid of heights. And, and I'm going to go there and I'm going to show these 
young people what it means to conquer your fears and get out here and do this ropes course. And so what I did, I, I had to buckle into the harness, right? That's the first thing you do. And, and the harness is all these straps and buckles and belts and things, and they cinch it all up and it's really awkward and uncomfortable. And, and on the back of the harness, see, there's a, a hook where they attach a rope. And that way, when you're climbing on all these elements, if you're to fall, then that will catch you and hold you. Now, of course, I'm climbing up on this and I'm thinking, I don't need the rope to catch me. I'm going to hang on because I don't want to fall. I don't want to test to see if this rope is really strong enough to catch me. If this harness is really secure, I would rather just do it on my own. I'm going to hang tight to the ropes and, and I'm going to just go through this. So first of all, it started out with this ladder. You climb up the ladder. I'm thinking, I got this. I've climbed ladders before. It's not hard. My feet are each on a rung. My hands are each on a rung. I can hold on. I'm okay. This is good. Then I get to the top and there's kind of this big netting piece there made out of ropes and, and stuff. And you had to kind of grapple onto the, the ropes and climb across, you know, and shimmy your way across. And once again, I thought, you know, this is awkward. It's moving a lot. It's shaky, but I think I can handle this. My, my feet and, and my hands, you know, even if I miss a step here or, or a grip here, I've got, you know, other handholds here and I can kind of maintain this. I'm going to be okay. Then I got to the next part of the ropes course and it was a long log and you just had to walk straight across that log. All right, this, this log is probably about this big around and, and you just literally had to walk across. There's no railings, there's nothing to hold on to. You just had to balance your way across this balance beam to the other side and it was probably 15 feet across. Now, if the log was on the ground, it would have been no problem. I could walk back and forth on that all day and never feel like I was gonna fall. But when you're 20 feet up in the air, then you're looking down at the heights and your knees are starting to shake and your palms are getting very sweaty and you're thinking to yourself, man, I don't know. And, and I was even tempted, right? If no one else had been there, I would have been tempted to get down on my hands and knees and kind of crawl across this thing, you know? But I thought, you know, I have to be tough. I have to be strong. I'm the leader. I have to demonstrate to these young people what it means. I'm going to, I'm going to put you know, one foot after the other, I'm gonna make my way across this log. So I slowly stepped out, I balanced myself, my knees were shaking, but I made it across the, the log and I thought, finally, finally, I'm good. This, this can only get better from here. I've, I've pretty much conquered the ropes course, I should be fine. Well, little did I know that the last element of the ropes course, right, the last thing that you were supposed to do, you're supposed to climb up this telephone pole and stand on top of the pole, right? And then you're supposed to jump out and try to catch this trapeze swing bar, right? And that was the way you get down from this ropes course, right? There was no ladder to climb back down, no slide going down. No, you had to jump out. Now, when I was on the ground watching other people do the ropes course, I happened to notice that most people who were jumping off of that log were missing the catch from this swinging trapeze bar and they were having to trust that the rope was gonna hold them up. Now, I was scared out of my mind. I mean, I climbed up to the top of this telephone pole and literally my knees were shaking and you're trying to stand up on top of this pole that, and it feels like the pole is moving like this and you've got your feet on top and man, it, it is nerve wracking and gosh, if I have, I have sweaty palms just thinking back to that moment and I remember standing there on top of this pole and, and I'm just sweating and, and, and I'm thinking to myself, what am I doing up here? This is the craziest thing in the world. I would never be doing this if it weren't for the peer pressure of all these students watching me and, and I'm standing there and, and in order to jump out and catch that trapeze bar and that swing, you, you really had to bend your knees and you had to launch off of that, you know? And, and so I was like, I'm gonna try my best to, to launch off of there, but I, Man, I didn't want to. I didn't want to trust that rope. I didn't want to put my trust in that rope at all, but I did it. I, I bent my knees and, and I, I kind of closed my eyes, gritted my teeth, and then, and then I took one last look and I leaped off of that pole to try to catch that trapeze bar. In that moment, I had to take a leap of faith. I had to trust that if I didn't catch the, the bar that, that I wasn't gonna hit the ground and, and kill myself, right? I had to trust that my harness, my rope, everything was secure, that I was gonna be okay. And, and, and 
It was a scary experience, right? Now, I want you to know, just for the record, I did catch the trapeze bar, right? I did. I had to show the kids, right? This is how you do this thing. But even then, you had to let go of the trapeze bar to drop to the ground. There was no way. And so you still had to take this leap of faith. You still had to trust that the harness was going to catch you. And I feel like that is a little bit of an illustration of our lives. I feel like we're kind of going through lives and in a way at times we don't want to. We want to trust in ourselves. We want to trust in our own ability. But God is saying, look, I've got you strapped in. I've got you buckled into my harness. You're in my hands. I'm never going to let you go. I'm never going to let you fall. I'm not going to drop you. You are secure and safe in my hands. You can step out into life. You can jump into the unknown. You can take that leap of faith knowing that I'm here to catch you and that I will be there. You see, I want to encourage you today that you can trust God with your life. What do you do when, when evil and injustice run rampant in the world? You trust in God because the righteous live by faith. What do you do when a president or political leader gets elected that's not your president? Well, you trust in God because the righteous will live by faith. What do you do when the doctor calls with the bad news? You say, I'm going to trust in God because he's, he's got me and the righteous live by faith. What, what do you do when you see trouble on every hand and it's dark and you don't know the way forward? Well, you live by faith, trusting that no matter what happens, God has got you in his hands. Now, the book closes in chapter 3 with a response from Habakkuk, right? Habakkuk writes almost like this chapter that's a psalm of worship and praise to God, just acknowledging who God is and, and, and worshiping and praising God in the midst of everything that he's experienced. And, and so he goes, he goes in Habakkuk 3, verse 2, he says, O Lord, I have heard the report of you, and your work, O Lord, do I fear in the midst of the years, revive it. In the midst of the years, make it known. In wrath, remember mercy. God came from Teman and from the Holy One, from Mount Paran. His splendor covered the heavens. The earth was full of His praise. His brightness was like the light. Rays flashed from His hands, and He veiled His power. Before Him went pestilence. Plague followed at His heels. He stood and measured the earth. He looked and shook the nations. Then the eternal mountains were scattered. The everlasting hills sank low. His were the everlasting ways. See, Habakkuk ends this book with this psalm of praise to God. He's like, God, I'm confused. I don't understand everything. I don't have all the answers, but here's what I know. I know you are powerful and you are in control. And Habakkuk just goes into this praise and worship mode about how all-powerful and sovereign God is, about how God is in control of everything. You jump down and verse 13 is, is a really great verse. I love this verse because Habakkuk 3.13, it says, you went out for the salvation of your people, for the salvation of your anointed. Who do you think that's talking about? I mean, this right here in Habakkuk is a reference to the Messiah, to Jesus Christ, who would come and, and step out for the salvation of of his people. It goes on, you crushed the head of the house of the wicked. This is a reference going all the way back to Genesis 3 when Adam and Eve sinned in the garden and God made a promise to Adam and Eve, you're going to have offspring that's going to rise up and be a Messiah that will save you and will crush the head of the enemy. And here in Habakkuk 3, we have this promise that God is with us, that Jesus will rise up as the anointed one to crush the head of the wicked. Habakkuk 3.16, he says this, I hear and my body trembles. My lips quiver at the sound. Rottenness enters into my bones. My legs tremble beneath me. Yet I will quietly wait for the day of trouble to come upon the people who invade us. I love this verse because Habakkuk is saying, God, I'm a mess right now. It's like me at the top of that ropes course. My legs are shaking. Everything is blurry. Nothing makes sense to me. I'm in a fog of darkness. I look around the world and I see violence and injustice everywhere. But I will quietly wait for your plan to unfold. 
That's what Habakkuk says. I'm going to trust you. God, I'm going to be the righteous one who lives by faith. Even though my life is a mess right now, I'm going to trust you that you are in control. And the last few verses of Habakkuk, so powerful. Habakkuk 3, 17 through 19. He says this, Though the fig tree should not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines, the produce of the olive fail, and the fields yield no food, the flock be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stalls, Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. God the Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the deer's. He makes me tread upon high places. Habakkuk is saying this, God, even if I lose everything, I will still trust you. He has these references if there's no cattle in the stalls or, or, or if the crops don't produce. You know, he, he's talking in references that, that his people would understand because they didn't have money in banks. They, they had crops in the field. They had, they had cattle in the stalls. And, and Habakkuk is saying, God, even if everything I have is stripped away, even if there's no money in the bank, even if my, the stock market crashes and, and my portfolio crashes and burns, God, even if, even if I have nothing for my retirement, God, even if I have uh, n- no food in the pantry to feed my family, God, I'm still going to trust you. That's what Habakkuk is saying. He's saying, I will trust you in the midst of the darkness. God, you are enough. And so what is our response to the book of Habakkuk? I mean, this is an old book written many, many years ago, and, and yet Habakkuk tackles this question of what do we do when life gets hard? And the, the thing that we have to ask ourselves right now as we, as we wrap this message up is, what do I need to trust God for? Where is it in my life that I'm not trusting God completely? Where is it that, that I'm not resting in, in his sovereign control over the universe? I mean, most of us, we don't have to trust God for where's our next meal coming from or where are we going to sleep tonight? No, we're, we live in a blessed culture. We're provided for. We don't worry about where our next meal is coming from. But can I ask you this? Can I ask you, have you trusted God for your future? Have you trusted God for his plan for your life? Have, have you trusted God for your significance? Right? I mean, some of us are striving and seeking to be something or to matter in this world, but have you trusted God with that? Have you trusted God with your happiness, with your expectations? Have you just said, God, even if all my expectations aren't met, I'm still going to trust in you. I'm still going to walk with you and believe that you are enough. You see, one of the main lessons of Habakkuk is that our peace, our inner peace, doesn't depend on our outward circumstances or prosperity. It's about faith and trust in God. Maybe some of you watching would say, you know, Pastor, I've never trusted God for anything in my life. And I want to encourage you and invite you to take that very first step. To say, you know what, I'm tired of trying to do life my own way. I'm tired of of depending on myself. And I want to turn and I want to come to God and trust Him. To trust what Jesus did for me on the cross when He died to pay the price for my sins, to come to that same realization that Martin Luther came to, that that I can never work or earn favor with God, that I have to just trust that what he did for me is enough and rest in that. And today, can I encourage you to reach out to God by faith and be saved, to trust and believe that he has your life in his hands. What are we to do when life gets hard? We're to trust in God. What are we to do when we don't understand? We're to trust in God. What are we to do when we can't see a way forward? We are to trust in God because the righteous shall live by faith. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for your word and thank you for the encouragement of this book that we need to walk by faith, that we need to trust you, that we need to rest in you. God, even when life doesn't make sense, even when we don't understand. God, thank you for Habakkuk and his his vulnerability, his transparency, coming to God, saying, God, how long? And and really wrestling with his doubts and fears. And thank you that you met him right where he was at and and you met his doubts and fears and you you gave him hope. And that, Lord, by the end of this letter that he wrote, by the end of this book, he he had turned. His, His worry was now turning to worship. His fear was now turning to faith. God, thank you that you did this work in his heart. And I pray now, for the one watching, that God, you would do the same for them, 
that you would take their fears and turn them to faith, that you would take their worries and turn it to worship, that you would help them to see that, God, you have a purpose and a plan in this life and that we can trust you even when life gets hard. And so, God, right now I pray for the one who's never trusted in Jesus, that maybe today they would take that very first step to put their faith and trust in the one who loves them so much. God, thank you so much for how you love us. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Church, thank you again for watching. It's been an honor to be in God's word together with you. I hope you'll join us for the rest of this series as we unpack some of the books of the Old Testament and the Minor Prophets. Most of all, I hope you have a blessed week and that you remember you are loved. Well, hello, everyone. That was an incredible message in the book of Habakkuk, and we hope it was a blessing to you. We just have a few announcements today, but first and foremost, we would love for you to connect with us. There is a button on the platform you are watching on that literally says connect with us. If you can click that, it'll take you to a page that just allows you to um, let us know how we can be praying for you. Uh, You can fill out some info just so we know that you're here watching with us. Uh, We want to know who's here. We want to know who's watching with us. And even more so, we want to be praying with you. We want to know how we can celebrate with you in what is going on in your life. And so please let us know. Please click that link to connect with us today. Here at Mission Church, uh, we love to talk about these three ways that we can be connected, and that is to worship, that is to serve, and that is to grow. And you are obviously engaging in the worship aspect right now by just joining us in our online service. And we have people coming on Sundays and and, and enjoying our worship service with us and engaging in that. And also the last one, uh, growing. We have small groups going on right now. We have uh, Bible classes going on at our church every Tuesday night. And people are growing. People are, are, are growing in their faith, growing in their knowledge of the scripture. And so today I want to focus on the middle one, and that is serve. Now, this is huge because we believe that this is a huge part in being engaged and building the kingdom of God and building the church, right? The bride of Christ. And we want to just encourage you to pray and to think about how you can connect more and be more engaged with us as a church. And there is a serve button on the platform you are watching on. You can click that. It's going to take you right to our website. Uh, And if you want to go to just straight to our website, it's it's joinmission.com and you can click on the serve tab. And there are plenty of ways to serve here at Mission Church. Uh, We love to all be bought in. There's so much to do. There's so much ministry to do and we would love your help. And so please, if you're not connected in that way and if you haven't served somewhere We would love for you to start here. And with that even being said, we have a thing called Growth Track. It's going to be starting in person at Mission Church the first week of this following month. And this is a consistent thing that we do, and this is the perfect way for our people here to be able to partner with us at Mission Church. And you get to learn more about who we are and, and where we've been and kind of why we do the things that we do. But more importantly, it helps you get more connected with us as a church and partner with us financially, through serving, um, through, through just the worship services here, and, and it helps you partner more with us. So if you want to take this next step, this is going to be during the second service on May 1st. Uh, at 11 a.m. and you can join us then and uh, that'll be just the perfect way to engage more with us um, and, and to try to step into that big three, the worship, the serve, and to grow. Well, last but not least, I want to talk about giving today. Um, if you are a faithful giver at Mission Church, I just want to say thank you. Uh, we are grateful for your, um, your, your sacrificial giving to the church and, and to the Lord, and um, we cannot do it. Um, you know, we, we couldn't do all of these things without the people who give faithfully here at Mission Church. Um, and so, but if this is your first time joining us today, please feel no obligation to give. We hope and pray that just this service and that this message has just been a blessing to you. If you feel led to give today, there is a give link on the platform you're watching on. You can click that and you can give as the Lord leads you today. Well, 
again, we are grateful that you have joined us and we hope that you can join us again next week. We hope to see you in person uh, soon and we are just so grateful with just what all the Lord is doing here. Um, and so again, thank you for joining us and remember you are loved. Then through